Hello, everyone. I wanted to tell you about two trips we're sponsoring this year, uh, part of our Geo Tours uh, portion of the Skeptic Society is our social and science uh, explorations. The first one is June 2nd through 16th, so 14 days, two weeks from Ireland to Iceland on a cruise ship with none other than Richard Dawkins. This is the passage from Ireland to Iceland, we're calling it. And Richard Dawkins will be the uh, invited guest and lecturer where you can hang out with him for two weeks. As on this ship, the Vega, it has a guest of 152 um, plate people that can join. So it's not a big, huge cruise ship with thousands of people. So you get to intimate time with, with Richard. Uh, it starts in Dublin. It goes to Reykjavik as we explore Europe's northernmost islands, Scotland's Hebrides, Orkneys, and Shetlands, Denmark's Faroes Islands, and Iceland. A remote world known for its rugged landscape, picturesque villages, fascinating history, and nature lovers' uh, delights. The second trip is from Greenland to uh, Canada's Nova Scotia. We're calling this Wonders of the Arctic on the same ship, just a 152-person ship called the Vega. It's a beautiful ship. Our featured guest for that trip, which is September 23rd through October 10th, uh, is Jared Diamond. Yes, Jared. So we have Richard Dawkins and Jared Diamond, two of the biggest names of our generation, two of the greatest minds, both good friends. Just picture just sitting on a ship, just hanging out with these guys. So, of course, they're lecturing, but breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they're just sitting around, and you can sit there and chat with two of the greatest minds of our time. Uh, this second trip, September 23rd through October 10th, uh, goes from Greenland to Nova Scotia with a bunch of different stops in between. So check it out. Uh, go to skeptic.com slash geology underscore tours, or just go to our website, skeptic.com. You'll see it prominently on the homepage there. Again, skeptic.com slash geology underscore tours to get access to those and sign up. Uh, these are big, fun trips. I mean, I've done a bunch of these myself. And uh, it, it's just great to be able to spend so much time with such great minds of our generation. All right. Thanks for listening. Here's our podcast. Uh, Samuel, thanks for coming on the show. Give us uh, a, a little explanation. How does a Yale psychiatrist who studies depression come to write about purpose? <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this dates back. I actually wanted to write this book since before I chose my field of medicine. I was a, a medical student and uh, for whatever reason, I was kind of having an existential crisis. And it, to me, it, it, it seemed like the theory of evolution was a bit of a stumbling block for uh, maybe a search for purpose. There's a, a great quote from a, a professor in the, the 60s, Tyndall, who says, you know, in the inevitable march of evolution, life is of profound unimportance, a mere eddy in the primeval slime. And that, those types of things just kind of hit me. And I said, well, is this really, are we really just an accident? And I had a period where I did a lot of research and studying and, and reflecting and, and came to conclude otherwise. And I, at that point, I felt intensely enough that I wanted to write a book. So um, after a long while, I, I brought it back off the, the shelf and uh, started writing right around the time that COVID hit. And here we are about four years later. Is there any relationship between depression and, I don't know, lack of purpose or existential crisis over purpose or anything like that? Or does depression have other causes? Well, uh, depression has many forms, certainly. And, um, it, you know, it's interesting, the field of, of mental health has shifted a lot in the last 40, 50 years. Now everything is about neuroscience and molecules and, and you know, the really lower levels. We've shifted a, away a bit from the higher levels of psychology. Not that there aren't people doing research, but the vast majority of people in, in research and mental health are searching at a lower level. And certainly there, there needs to be that, that search at, uh, of neuroscience. Uh, I think we have neglected a little bit the higher levels uh, and and there is a, in many cases, um, you know, increasingly we seem to be treating a form of human suffering that seems to be caused by, uh, you know, a lack of cohesion in, in social groups and, and a lack of meaning that almost always, you know, people point to their 
their relationships as a, as a source of meaning in their life. Yeah. Yeah. I had Ralph Lewis on the show. He's a psychiatrist in Canada who uh, treats people with all kinds of disorders, not just depression, but other mental disorders. And yeah, he, he thinks certainly the study of purpose and meaningfulness, happiness, all that is uh, at least indirectly related to it, even though there's other, co- even you can have both. I mean, there could be biochemical causes that are then triggered by environmental issues or, or in some interactive effect. Is there anything, what's the latest on SSRIs and depression? I, rec- I seem to recall that there's some meta-analysis that show they don't really do much. Well, they do. Uh, it, they certainly do. Um, it, you know, they, they've been around a long time. They're, they're not as effective as maybe we hope. Uh, there are a lot of promising uh, things on the, on the horizon for what we would call as treatment-resistant depression. This is essentially depression that hasn't responded to, you know, at least one or two standard medications, which almost always include an SSRI. Um, so uh, SSRIs can be really helpful in, in, in given situations. They are not the end all be all and, and we need better treatments and, and just a better understanding of what leads people to, to, to come into this, what we call syndrome of depression. It's, you know, our understanding of it is not uh, the same as, you know, the understanding of type one diabetes, where we know there's a, uh, you know, an autoimmune reaction that destroys the, the cells that create insulin and, and, and so forth. And, and, you know, a replacement of insulin is the, the key therapeutic for type 1 diabetes. So um, and part of this is, is really uh, our, our, you know, the, the hard problem of consciousness. We don't know how the, how the brain interacts with the mind and, and so forth. Um, it's, it, you know, in, a, in essence, we've understood mostly how all the other organs in the body work. Um, but psychiatry is kind of the last frontier. It's not just psychiatry, of course, it's psychology and neuroscience and um, uh, still, still a lot to be fleshed out in this area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we're probably decades away, maybe a century <laughs> from solving these problems. I actually think maybe the hard problem of consciousness is not even a soluble one, at least the way it's phrased. Yeah. Um, you know, sorry to be repetitive to my regular listeners, but, you know, a- asking what's the neural network and wiring that gives rise to the recognition of speech and Broca's area or the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobe that recognizes faces or where the color red lights up in the occipital lobe. You know, we have a lot of that down pretty well. But the next step, what what is it like to be the wiring? Yeah. It's like, what? what? Uh, I mean, it, it just seems like a conceptually... I don't know, dumbfounding question. It certainly is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting, but it's, yeah, we're, we're still a ways away. I, I agree with you there. Yeah. You know, and, and also the word mind, I don't like that word either. I mean, I use it all the time too. Oh, my mind, you know, but it, it's really just what my brain is doing. It's just a process of what the brain does. We reify that word as if it's floating around up there somewhere in the ether of the gap between the neurons or some such thing. But even that, you know, sort of morphs into kind of metaphysical conceptions, depending on the language and how you use those words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, okay, maybe that's a good transition to your book. Oh, I know. Uh, here's the perfect transition to your book. Wasn't there something about the evolutionary origins of depression, not extreme depression where you can't even get out of bed, but I mean, just kind of normal sadness or a little bit more than that as a means of getting you to change your lifestyle or change your relationship or change something because it's not working. Yeah, there's, there's been a few people interested in uh, what could be called evolutionary psychiatry um, uh, in the same way that evolutionary psychology, I think probably David Buss is one of the, the forefathers of, of evolutionary psychology. Um, it, it hasn't maybe had the traction uh, for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I think I think a lot of these things, uh, you know, they're disorders, and so they're 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 not necessarily supposed to happen. You know, sometimes they're um, aspects of our brain that have have uh, gone a little too far. You know, anxiety certainly can serve a purpose to help us, you know, flee predators that sort of thing. But if it's always on and it never turns off, off that's clearly a a problem. Um, Evolutionary psychi- psychiatry, there, you know, there's a, a little bit of interest in it, but it, it hasn't uh, grown, you know, it hasn't taken root in the same way, say, evolutionary psychology. So still 
kind of early days there to see if we can explain some of these disorders uh, using kind of an evolutionary framework. Yeah. I think part of the problem that you addressed at the beginning of your book of this sort of misunderstanding of the theory of evolution or quoting evolutionary theorists from long time ago before yeah. we started thinking about these issues. You mentioned the, uh, let's see, who was this again? The Oh, this was um, uh, the one in the purely natural and inevitable march of evolution. Life is of profound unimportance. A mere yeah. eddy in the primeval, uh, primeval slime. Yeah. Who yeah. was it that said that? Uh, Tyndall. Oh, Tyndall, uh, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, back yeah. from... Quite a wait, 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 quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, and then you have um, uh, Lewis Thomas, one of my favorite writers when I was in college. I cannot make my peace with the randomness doctrine. I cannot abide the notion of purposelessness and blind chance in nature. And yet I do not know what to put in its place for the quieting of my mind. We talk, some of us anyway, about the absurdity of the human situation but we do this because we do not know how we fit in or what we are for. And then I don't know if you, I didn't see you, you quote Dawkins, you know, blind, pitiless indifference, his famous phrase. I mean, if you really believe that, yeah, that would be pretty depressing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. So let's so, start there. What's wrong with that argument from an evolutionary perspective? Well, this is what I originally thought. And so I thought, oh, well, you know, we're just kind of doomed to whittle away our, our hours and days in a, in a, you know, in a universe, a cold universe that is indifferent and, and where we have no higher order purpose or meaning. So, you know, I, and, you know, we're, we're probably going to disagree on this. I, I grew up in a, a religious background and, and that was part of what was uh, providing attention, you know, for me. Uh, so I, the, the randomness doctrine, I love that quote by Lewis Thomas that you just read. That for me was part of it. And, you know, um, I thought, well, if, if we are, if, if our existence is just an accident, then, then that is, you know, that, that seems to imply that there's no higher order purpose to our existence. Now, um, you know, I have a chapter in here which essentially sums up a lot of the work of Simon Conway Morris. I know he's been on the show and, and I really like his work. He was, he was generous enough to help, you know, review this chapter for technical inaccuracy. Uh, but it's, it's pretty clear, at least in my mind, from the literature that, uh, there are patterns in nature and the, you know, the notion of how different lines in the evolutionary tree seem to lead to the same outcomes over and over and over again um, seems to dispel this notion that, you know, that, that everything was totally random. Now, I'm sure randomness had some, uh, something to do with it. Like, for instance, it may be random, you know, the color of your eyes or the random reassortment of your parents' genes, but the fact that you have eyes and they're structured the way they are in almost the exact same way that the eyes of an octopus are structured, even though, you know, we, we evolved them through independent means, you know, that was not random. Uh, and so uh, this, for me, at least, it, it doesn't imply, it doesn't, you know, say, oh, there, you know, there must be a God necessarily, but it brings these worldviews closer together. Uh, and, and that's part of the, the picture that I'm, I'm trying to portray here. Yeah. Uh, for those not familiar with Simon Con Conway Morris, who didn't hear that episode, he writes about convergent evolution. And so and I read all his stuff and I, I he really um, moved me away from the far left wall of Steve Gould's emphasis on contingency. You know, evolution is not that contingent. If you rewound the tape and played it back again, not as a read only memory tape or it's just a recording of what happened, but actually just started the timeline over again, and let it play out. Uh, you know, it's not that it's, you know, we would get something with, you know, uh, organisms with no eyes or no limbs or no wings or no fins, no body types, you know, that Morris really shows how if you have a planet like ours with a certain amount of gravity and you have water and air and land, you're going to get organisms that have structures that uh, evolved to, I don't know, fly through the air and swim, you know, the fusiform body to swim through the ocean. And you got to have some kind of limbs to move around on land. So those are likely to come up again and again and again, eyes to see, ears to hear, and so on. I, I think that's right. So from there, how do you then start to move towards something called purpose? What, 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 maybe just tell us, what, what, what do you mean by that, purpose? Yeah, well, uh, another part of when I first started learning about evolution that, was, uh, that I didn't like was what it implied, or what, at least what I thought it in like, was what it implied or what I thought it implied about human nature. Um, so a couple of years after Darwin wrote his 
most influential book, The Origin of Species, in 1859, um, Herbert Spencer, another biologist, coined this phrase, survival of the fittest. And uh, biologists these days don't seem to use or like that phrase very much. There's, there's some problems with it, but, but it can be somewhat instructive. And I think when most people think of evolution and survival of the fittest, their minds jump to, okay, yeah, we're selfish, we are aggressive, you know, hypersexual, so many of the bad things about human nature. Is that, is that really what we are? And as you know, and, and as many people know who've studied this, it, it's much more complicated. Uh, there's lots of examples of altruism and um, cooperation and, and so forth. Uh, and, you know, there, there's lots of potential evolutionary mechanisms as to how this came about, these, you know, these different parts of our nature. What I think is perhaps the most relevant uh, has to do with what biologists refer to as the the issue of the level of selection, right? Uh, so survival of the fittest, survival of the fittest what, right? If you ask Dawkins, it's all about the gene. Well, what about a cell? Certainly as a biological entity, cells can reproduce and, and survive. Individuals, what, what, what about even higher levels of organization, group selection, and so forth? Um, group selection is controversial, but what's not controversial is, is kin selection. And when you think about the the types of traits, the social traits that would be favored on these different levels, primarily looking at individual selection versus a, a kin or even group selection, nature seems to have endowed us with opposing traits in this manner. You know, selfishness on one hand, but altruism on another, aggression, cooperation, and so forth. And, um, you know, I... I this kind of moves us, at least in my mind, out of a quagmire of, that has uh, 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 puzzled philosophers and others who study human nature. You know, what, what are we? Are we you know, ultimately selfish or altruistic? We're kind, well, it's kind of, yes, we're, we have the potential to be all of these things. And, um, you know, we can, we can go into further depth of, about the specific mechanisms. When you combine that with uh, the observation, the empirical observation experience, and I, this is probably a favorite topic of yours as well that we can dive into, but that we have some sense of ability to choose or free will. When you combine those different aspects of our nature, it seems like life is a test, that we all have kind of a bit of good and evil within us, and that part of the purpose of our existence is to choose within those competing natures. And that, to me, is part of the purpose of our existence. Mm-hmm. Yes, organisms uh, need to capture energy to survive, find mates to reproduce, yeah. flourish, and so on. So they have to have goals. So depending on what you mean by the word purpose, but it's a it's a kind of goal seeking behavior. I'm purpose. I'm moving purposely toward what? Well, there you can even go all the way down to single cell organisms that move in the chemical gradient towards some food, or they follow the light upwards or whatever, that's a kind of a goal-directed behavior. Now, they don't have a brain that's aware that this is what it's doing, but they're, they're acting purposefully. Yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, purpose or the sense of purpose has been a little bit of heresy in biology for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a biologist, so, you know, who am I to say that, that this is, we should change this, but it, I, I do think there's this, there, there's a bit of turning in the other direction that, you know, that may not be, that, that's more of a philosophical assumption than, you know, it's not like someone ran a study and said, well, the conclusion says that biology says there's no purpose to life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, you know, certainly there, there are kind of what you might frame as lower levels of purpose, kind of like you, you, you specified a, an organism has, you know, certainly behaves in a way that seems purposeful. Um, I'm maybe a little bit more grandiose than this in this book that, you know, there is almost a cosmic purpose to our existence and that it seems like life is, you know, we are here to develop our ability to choose between these opposing natures within us. You know? See, I, I could go all the way with you without having any <laughs> higher power at all. That everything you said, in fact, pretty much everything you wrote, I've written something similar in my books. And it's like, why is he calling this a theistic evolution book? Or what, what has that got to do with it? You can derive everything you said just from kind of a bottom-up game theory logic. 
of how organisms behave purposely to solve certain problems. And I, th I think so much of it, we get hung up on the language. Um, you know, again, purpose, you know, is there any purpose to the universe outside of earth or whatever? Well, no. What's the purpose of a star? It's, it's just converting hydrogen to helium. It, yeah. It, it, that's a purpose, but it, you know, we're not, that's not what we're talking. It doesn't know about us. It doesn't know we're here. I call this Alvy's air, you know, Alvy Singer, uh, Woody, uh, Alan's character in, in Annie Hall, where as a flashback as a child, remember this, where he, he refuses to do his homework and his mom takes him to the psychiatrist. You know, Alvy, why won't you do your homework? The universe is expanding. <laughs> it's like, what? He goes, well, so one day it's all going to just blow up. And so there's no point, you know, billions of years from now, there's no point in my doing my homework. And, and his mother upbraids him, you know, what's the universe got to do with it? We live in Brooklyn and Brooklyn's yeah. not expanding. So I call that <laughs> Alvy's era, right? The wrong time frame. Um, you know, maybe there is a God, maybe there isn't, but, but either way, it doesn't really matter because what you do now is what matters. It, it matters to the people that are affected by the things that happen now. That's how I think about that. Yeah. I guess where I would, uh, I'm going to diverge a little bit here is that if, if, if this life is actually a test as, as this framework that I try to lay out in this book, uh, provides i don't i don't think it makes sense that there's nothing after this right if if what would be the purpose of of you know these principles laying forth this this you know this mortal experience that we have if there's nothing that that comes after this now you know we can go in circles about that um i you know i've, I've read part of your book about the what is it called the um the heavens uh uh, 2018 what, what was the yeah, name of heavens that book? on yeah, heaven, yeah. Uh, heavens on earth yeah heavens on earth you know the, the search for the afterlife that sort of thing uh to me it, it, it i'm i'm compelled by this and probably more than you are obviously that that it doesn't make sense that this is the only only stage for our existence i think this is more than a one act play yeah why do you think that well i just i the way that you know the the non-randomness uh in uh, of of evolution that we're, we're not we're not here by accident that there are these principles of nature that, that there's that are seated with inevitability and the the focus of uh it seems like we are you know we we have this conflicting nature within us which we're, we're here to choose between good and evil i think this is a kind of a truth that is espoused by so many of the world's religions um and you know i i don't know exactly what what it's going to look like i you know i have my personal sect that that i adhere to um but i do believe that you know a lot of people have this notion that the most valuable things in life which is their relationships uh are not necessarily going to disintegrate uh with with the end of our our mortal experience um <laughs> well i think i hope you're right <laughs> depends on where <laughs> depends on where i go <laughs> i i, can, I, I, I yeah <laughs> i'm sure that there was, there was so, I don't remember which book it was of yours, but you, you, you know, when you were, I think it was one of your early books and you, you said you were speaking with some woman and she asked what your opinion was of the afterlife and you said, I'm for it. <laughs> for and, it, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Was, oh, well, I mean, am if, too. <laughs> if it's an afterlife that's interesting, you know, this kind of eternity, eternity, I mean, it's a long time, especially near the end, as they say, uh, yeah. to do what, <laughs> to, you know, to just sit in loving harmony with God. I don't even know what that means. I mean, is there anything to do? You know, are there, you know, is it, can I ride my bike there? Is there challenges? You know, it sounds yeah. boring to me. Are there good yeah. conversations? I don't know. It's such, it's a, it's such an ethereal concept, literally, uh, that it's hard to imagine what it could possibly even mean. Uh, to continue on in some state without your body, well, maybe there's one Christian sect that thinks you you are resurrected as your body as a 30 year old. That I, I forget how they came up with the number. Maybe it was because Jesus was 30 when he was crucified, or maybe that's kind of the ideal state yeah. of your mind and body at age yeah. 30. After that, it's all downhill. Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sect are you, by the way? I, I'm uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They 
Oh, you're a Mormon. Mormon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Yeah, that's why you have five kids. Oh, you're you're <laughs> actually you're actually a slacker there. Come on, <laughs> Elon's Elon wants you guys, all of us, to get, have, have five babies. <laughs> yeah. So he, yeah. so we can uh, colonize Mars. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. So I mean, but I, not, but let me just point out to our listeners: none of what you argue in the book has to do with that. You don't have to be a Christian or anything. I think to accept what you're arguing, except for the ultimate, you know, kind of the next step that you take there. I think. Yeah. This. I mean. This is primarily a science book, the way I see it. I have kind of some, uh, a few allusions to, to more than that and references to God and so forth. But, you know, if we want to stick with the science, I'm happy to do that. And towards the end, we can, I, you know, I can share what I think um, about, about some of these uh, other questions. But, you know, the way that evolution shaped us. So, so if, if, you, if you believe and, and accept kind of what I've said so far is that you know, the way evolution shaped us leaves us pulled in different directions. We have capacities for altruism, but also selfishness. Uh, one of the ways, one, one of the ways that we can help ourselves to accentuate the better aspects of our nature, uh, I think has to do with the origin of the most pro-social aspects of our nature from an evolutionary standpoint. And that is when we are embedded within family relationships uh, and, and, and good personal relationships, the better angels of our nature tend to predominate because that's where the strongest forms of love and cooperation and altruism seem to have their root, at least in the flesh. Um, you know, and, uh, something that I point out is the unique nature of our offspring that are utterly helpless. And, uh, you know, some people who study infant development refer to the first few months of life as the fourth trimester because. Our, our babies are born half-baked, right? And uh, as a result, you know, everything a baby does is, is you know, crying, cooing, sucking is, is meant to tie the parents to the baby. And that's adaptive evolutionarily. As a, as, a, as a result, human parents have had to develop a deep love and concern for their children. Um, and so I think the strongest forms of, of this have their root in, in kin selection or the way that evolution shaped family relationships. And when we are embedded in family relationships, that is helpful for, uh, you know, men. And that, that there, that tem there tends to be a very socializing aspect of fatherhood uh, that has an evolutionary root. Uh, but I think it's also good for women and children. So, um, and I think that has to do with the way that, that nature shaped us. So that's another aspect to it. And I, and I think that's why family relationships are, are so important. They're hard because we have, you know, this other aspect to us, you know, selfishness, aggression, and so forth. And if we're not careful, that obviously gets in the way of relationships and can, you know, we, we can end up sabotaging the source of deepest meaning in our lives. Yeah. Just one final point on that Alvi's era thing. Uh, I, that, that, that was one of my columns in Scientific American, which I wrote after I watched a debate between um, Shelley Kagan and uh, William Lane Craig in which they were talking about the Holocaust and the Nazis and all that. And, you know, Craig's argument was, you know, if there's no God and there's no afterlife and, you know, the universe just burns out after another 15 billion or 45 billion, whatever it is, then, then it doesn't, doesn't matter what Hitler did to the Jews. And, and Kagan, Kelly, Shelley uh, Kagan's response, it doesn't matter. Are you kidding me? These people suffered. It matters. It matters to the Jews who were murdered. It matters to their families who suffered. It matters now. We want justice now, not cosmic justice. We want the Nuremberg trials now. Maybe there is a God in an afterlife in a cosmic courthouse, but who cares? <laughs> we don't live then. We live now. Anyway, that was my point on that. Yeah. You might be right. I, you know, again, I think I hope you're right. <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows for sure what happens after we die. You know, it's maybe consciousness floats off the brain and goes off into some quantum field somewhere, whatever. I don't know. You know, I read about all that stuff. It's possible. I don't want to say I know for sure because I don't. Nobody does. Uh, but so why not try to make things right now? And from there, everything you say, I'm on board with. I think families are important. I think all the stuff you wrote about, about the effects of marriage on men, oh boy, is that ever true? <laughs> and look what yeah. happens when, you know, f families break down, like in the black community, from 25% in 1963 to 75% kids raised by single moms. Yeah. This is not good. Not good at all. And, and not just black families, poor white families, you know, 
Yeah. Charles Charles Murray wrote about that in Coming Apart. You know, it's more economics than it is race. It's, you know, this impoverishment, lack of employment, lack of, you know, kind of purpose to get up and out the door and, and having a spouse and children is one of those drivers. So I, yeah. I'm on board with you there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm certainly on board with you with, you know, we need to make things better now and not just wait. I, I do think, a, you know, a cosmic or eternal sense of justice can be comforting. Not, I don't think it should be an excuse that we shouldn't be engaging in efforts to make the world a better place now. Uh, but I, I, I think it can be comforting because life is profoundly unfair. I don't, I don't think I have to convince you of that. And uh, this, this notion that, you know, things are going to be made right can be reassuring. Yeah. Uh, okay, let, let me just, let's go back to kind of the game theory logic of this. Let me just read something I okay. wrote in um, uh, The Moral Arc. So here I'm, I'm starting with Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, and then he switches to using language of um, replicators and survival machines. The, so the replicators are the genes, the, the, bo the body holding the genes or the cell or whatever is the survival machine. To a survival machine, another survival machine, which is not its own child or another close relative, is part of its environment, like a rock or a river or a lump of food. But there's a difference between a survival machine and a rock. A survival machine is inclined to hit back if exploited. This is because it too is a, is a machine that holds its immortal genes and trusts for the future, and it too will stop at nothing to preserve them. Thus Dawkins concludes, natural selection favors genes that control their survival machines in such a way that they make the best use of their environment. This includes making the best use of other survival machines, both of, uh, both of the same and of different species. Survival machines could evolve to be completely selfish and self-centered, but there's something that keeps their pure selfishness in check, and that is the fact that other survival machines are inclined to hit back if attacked, to uh, retaliate if exploited, or to attempt to use or abuse other survival machines first. So if I follow, I think you, you, you argue something very similar in your chapter on that, that there's a, a, an evolutionary logic to not just being a selfish asshole, but to also being nice uh, and cooperative and pro-social and because, and so here's the, the next step. Um, if you're faking it, that is, if you're like a psychopath who knows what cues to give off to exploit people uh, and not be punished for it, but most of the time people will know you're faking it. You're, you're not genuine. So you actually have to believe it. Like, I really feel good about doing something nice for other people, like tipping in a a foreign city or whatever, and then go, but I feel better about myself, even if that person will, will never be able to reciprocate. And, and that then leads to better behavior. And the closest I can come to objective external morality or absolute morality or right or wrong would be something like that. You really believe it in your heart. You feel it. You feel good when you do something good for somebody else. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of reasons people can be altruistic and they, I think they can somewhat line up with, there, there's a lot of evolutionary mechanisms that various people have come up with over the years, you know, direct reciprocity or tit for tat giving, which is essentially a quid pro quo. There's indirect reciprocity, which is you want your reputation to be good. And, uh, but then I think there's a deeper form that you, you know, you want to do it because you're trying to help other people or other, uh, other people in your group or the society at large. Um, and there's, and, and, and again, those can roughly correspond to uh, the reasons that people might be altruistic today. Um, going back to what I think are the deepest forms that, that has to do with our families. Um, you know, it, it's an interesting, there, there's an interesting, I, I, I think there are contexts in our evolution, which led to both right there where, where it was maybe advantageous to be selfish Certainly, it doesn't take long to look back in the history book of humanity to, to see that's the case. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's there's a really interesting, and it, there's there's an interesting story of two shipwrecks at the same time and place. I, I got this from a colleague at Yale. Yeah, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Christakis, Christakis, yeah. right? Yeah, I and, love and, that story. Tell it, tell the whole yeah. story. It's a great. Well, great he, story. he he refers to it because he's looking at the inherent principles of society. I think it demonstrates the different levels of selection and. Uh, so in 1864, there were two shipwrecks uh, on the Auckland Islands. Those are located about 300 miles south of mainland New Zealand. 
And the first ship was captained by a man named Musgrave. And after about 18 months of a herring ordeal and much resourcefulness and ingenuity, all of the crew member of, of Musgrave's ship survived. Uh, at the same time, the second ship, led by name, a man named Delgarno, uh, most of the, the crew members of, of that ship died. And the key difference was in the group cohesion. You know, so the, the first ship, they, they acted like a team. And this was epitomized in the, the very first act of, of Musgrave. He carried an injured man on his back as he swam, he, as he swam from the wreckage to the, the safety of the shore. And the, and the experience of the other ship, you know, within a few days, they left a wounded man behind to, to die uh, as they sought, you know, better resources and food and so forth. So, you know, I, I really think, I, I think this is like a profound, just eternal principle and you know, those in biology may be old hat to you, but uh, there's a great quote from David Sloan Wilson and E.O. Wilson, I think it's a paper from 2006, where they said, you know, selfish individuals beat altruistic individuals, but altruistic groups beat selfish groups and everything else is commentary. And, you know, I just, I just think that's so fascinating and it, it is, uh, resonates with, with the tension that we, we experience in, in human nature. If I recall Nicholas Christakis's uh, reason for telling that story was that there's different social structures that work better or worse than others and that hierarchical command structures uh, don't always work. They may work well in the military on a ship that's functioning. Okay, you need a, a hierarchy of command. But uh, uh, under stress like that where everybody needs to pull their own weight, it's better to have a horizontal, more equality-based where everybody is in this together rather than having you know one uh, autocrat at the top telling everybody what to do. I think that was the point of that, right? So the message is, how should we structure society? Well, that that that's a subtitle of that book, right? Blueprint. Uh, what was Evo what evolutionary the, origins of a good society? Good we, society, yes. Yeah. So, and that's your point of bringing it up in your chapter on the good society. And how should we structure? So, well, we know democracies work better than autocracies. We can just look at current events. It certainly uh, seems to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, and so a democracy, uh, although there's a, a hierarchical structure to it with you know Congress and and so forth, and, and judges with a rule of law and, and courts, but but still it's pretty horizontal in the sense that we all get our say, at least in principle. At least we feel like we get our say, whether yeah. we do or not. I suppose it depends on the democracy. But I think that was the point. You know, so, you know, when you're talking about our better angels and our inner demons, so, you know, the whole point of society is we have this group of, of, of basically the third chimps living together. And so we don't kill each other. Uh, we have to dial up, the, you know, these structures in society and dial down these other ones that don't work so well. Yeah, you know, I think we all have a sense of what a good society would look like. And, you know, it would value inclusion and and uh, economic opportunity for those at the bottom, and it would, you know, provide freedom, but also, you know, justice and responsibility. Um, you know, the problem, and, and this is at the root of, of the political disagreements we have, is that when, you know, if you ask, say, 30 people to list the 10 principles or so of what a good society looks like in, in order from most important at least, they're gonna, you're going to come up with 30 different lists. Um, but I think a more fundamental thing that we overlook sometimes is that, you know, there's, there's no system that you can devise that is so perfect that the people in it don't have to be good, at least on a, on a, on a fundamental, even voluntary level. And so, you know, can, can we structure systems which are more likely to help people choose to behave in unselfish ways and so forth? And it, you know, between there, there's a lot, there's a lot of levels between us and Congress. There's a lot of kind of mediating organizations, and it's unfortunate in in American society. A lot of there's just this this deep loss of trust and community cohesion. Um, I, there's a lot of reasons, uh, but I think fundamentally, uh, the, the breakdown of of familial relationships is is a key problem. That we are facing and and you know uh in the end if if some of these meeting in institutions such as family break down you, you're not going to be able to hire enough enough police uh, <laughs> yeah let me read that statement from your uh opening of your pages as i write this book the united states 
In many other countries, there's a growing distrust of organizations, of political leadership, growing worrying of extremism, a waning desire to belong to organized faith groups or organizations of any kind, bowling alone. <laughs> yep. Certainly there are work. many potential reasons for the growing cynicism in the modern world, but in my opinion, at the heart of it lies a loss of faith, a loss of faith in a benevolent God, a loss of faith in the goodness of humanity, a loss of faith in an absolute purpose and meaning to our existence. Okay, so a couple things on that. Uh, so if we use a counterfactual reasoning of causality of these problems, what about Northern European countries who have very low levels of uh, church attendance and their high levels of atheism or non-belief of, of, of any kind of deity? And they function pretty well. Their societies are, are really quite healthy on almost any measures, homicides, suicides, uh, you know, teen pregnancy, STDs, abortion rates, and so on. They're way better than the United States who is by far the most religious of all the Western democracies, even though the rise of the nuns in the last few years has, has been quite striking, but we're still way ahead of Germany and Norway and you know, all these Northern European countries. They seem to be doing better. How do you explain that? I, part of it, I think, has to do with polarization. I, I, you know, I don't know those countries as well as I know the U.S., but uh, even if there's not necessarily faith in a God, there seems to be a faith in a society. And, and whether it's the political polarization, whatever it is that, that seems to be just uh, tearing our, the, the social fabric of U.S. life apart, um, you know, I, 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 I can't imagine that these countries have been totally immune to some of these changes. I think they have. Um, there are some ways in which, um, you know, we, you know, certainly in medicine, we, some of the some of the cost of this is 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 borne by us, and if you want to shift to medicine, we can do that. Um, you know, one of the reasons that our our healthcare is so expensive is because we we support the development a lot of a lot of the innovative treatments for for the rest of the world. Um, and uh, so, you know, I I don't know all the answers to to exactly why, but certainly there seems at least in this country to be a, a, a loss of, uh, of social trust, and that's a bad thing. Yeah, I think all of these things I mentioned, suicide, homicide, teen pregnancy, abortion, and so on, gun, gun violence, these all have separate causes. Uh, I don't say, well, it's religion that causes these things in America, because look at Northern European countries, they don't have religion, yeah. they don't have these. No, each of these has different causal factors. I think... I think the polarization is probably more political than religion. I think it's these, you know, at least from what I am told by political scientists, you know, that the number of people self-identifying as center left, center right is shrinking, and that those, you know, they're moving out toward yeah. the ends, and you know, and mm -hmm. and the whole Trump Biden thing coming up is it's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible. But um, yeah, okay, so. Anyway, so just kind of going through this kind of evolutionary logic of what you're reasoning here. So small hunter-gatherer groups um, are not perfectly harmonious. <laughs> uh, they do. There's still a handful of bullies, free riders, um, psychopaths, and so on. Here I, I lean on the research by Christopher Bohm, his Origins of Morality, where uh, you know why did so we become domesticated um, as a species compared to say chimps and orangs and gorillas, you know, it, I think it was Sapolsky who said, imagine a 747 full of chimpanzees. <laughs> they wouldn't even get to the other side of the country before they kill each other, you know, but we're, we're so we're the weird chimpanzee. We're able to do this. And, uh, but why aren't we able to do it perfectly? Why are there still some weirdos on the plane that, well, they get drunk or whatever, but, or, yeah. you know, there, there's still maybe one to 3%, right? You would know this better than me of psych psychopathy. Uh, that, among that's, males. that sounds about the right range. Yeah. Yeah. Why isn't it zero? How come natural selection didn't get rid of all the free riders and bullies and assholes? Well, because we, I, I don't know exactly the answer. Um, I think it has to do with, with the fact that, you know, uh, people can migrate, you know, go to new groups. And, and again, you know, if you have a group of pure, uh, pure altruists, that selfish person is going to do pretty well. One of the keys to your thesis is that we're making choices. Yeah. Okay, all my listeners, they're going to know Sapolsky's and Sam Harris's arguments of hard determinism. What is your response to those arguments? 
Well, uh, let's start with maybe Sapolsky is, you know, his book came out a couple months ago. Um, I, I just, I think there's good evidence that even in relatively simple organisms, behavior is, is not deterministic. Uh, you know, you have these experiments with very simple organisms, say a leech or a nematode roundworm, uh, and they behave, you put them as far as you can measure in the exact same situations and they respond not in a deterministic manner but a probabilistic way and you can't necessarily predict uh you know i think that it's sapolsky will say well show me show me a neuron that is an uncaused cause and i don't think i i i I, I think it's more a downstream neuron that is getting different signals and integrating them in probabilistic ways, not necessarily, not deterministic ways, but probabilistic ways, which makes uh, for, you know, the indeterminacies of behavior. Um, I, it's not at all clear to me. I don't, I, I don't think the jury is out. It, it, the jury's still out that the universe is deterministic. Um, Certainly, when you talk about the subject, inevitably you have to come up to what to, to, to definitions. Uh, people, when they throw around the term like free will, they sometimes end up talking about different things. So, you know, the, for me, I, I'm in some ways I'm a, I'm a libertarian in, in free will. I, I believe that we actually have you know different paths open to us, and that we have top-down causation. We have mental control. That's the the free part. You know, there's some freedom. Uh, there's also will part, which is that our mental states have causal influence on our behavior. So, um, again, I, I don't think it's an upstream neuron that is an uncaused cause. I think there's lots of competing dispositions. You know, when, when Sam Harris, I think it's Sam Harris who says, uh, you know, we, we can't choose our wills, right? And that may be true. But it's, it's an overly simplistic argument and, and model for human behavior. All of us have competing wills, right? You know, I want to be in good shape, but I also want to enjoy dessert, right? What, what will am I going to follow? And, you know, it's, it's obviously more complicated, but this is where, you know, there's some neuron or neural circuit somewhere that is integrating competing kind of poles and, and has to... You know, there, there's a a probabilistic outcome from that. Um, on the on the will part, you know, this is this is top down causation, and I think that there's a lot of evidence from psychology that our our mental states influence our behavior, and that things like simulation studies, uh, goal setting, implementation intentions, and that sort of. They're, they're, I to me, it's 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 pretty abundant that our, our mental states have causal influence on our behavior. So um, certainly, you know, our choices are also influenced by biological factors and environmental factors, um, but it doesn't mean that we don't have any say in it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 100% with you on that all the way. Uh, and, and, uh, and I expand on a little bit that there's not just you as a self now as a snapshot and that's it. There's you now and your future you. So there's yeah. future Sam tomorrow who would like to weigh whatever you weigh. And so tonight when, you know, your wife and five kids go, let's get the ice cream out. And, uh, yeah. So you have to make yeah. choices. Maybe we don't have ice cream in the house. So I'm not tempted. So future Sam doesn't come to the weakness at 630 after dinner when the yeah. ice cream is going to seem really good. That's yeah. my weakness <laughs> right yeah. around 630. So, uh, mine as well. I, an, another, another aspect of this, you know, I, I've heard Sapolsky say, you know, well, you know, you're not, it seems like Sapolsky's criteria for free will is just unrealistically high. And if there were something like that, where our choices are not at all constrained by our past experiences, then there would be no such thing as the self, right? A self is a consistent pattern of behavior and choices and so forth. And, you know, if we made decisions that were not at all constrained or you know, Kevin Mitchell uses the term informed uh, by our past experiences, then that, would, that wouldn't be free will, that would be randomness, 
And, uh, and so, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Randomness doesn't give you free will. No, uh, my, my argument with Sam on the, could you have done otherwise definition because he has this rewind the tape again, sort of like mm -hmm. Gould's metaphor, but he's using it as a read only memory tape. It is literally an exact replica of what already happened. Well, in that case, no, you, you could not have done otherwise because we're just watching a tape of what you already did. And, and, but that isn't the universe we live in. You know, no, we live in not. a universe with the second law of thermodynamics and entropy, and you can't step into the same river twice because it's not the same river and you're not the same person stepping into it. <laughs> so yeah. um, you can learn from what happened already and say, well, yeah. yesterday I did that. So today I'm going to do this instead. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah. I, there's another aspect to that I, I think that is interesting with regards to epiphenomenalists so so epiphenomenalism is is this sense that you know among free will kind of deniers that you know our thoughts are not influencing our behavior they're just byproducts they're they're observers of what's going on and uh i think part of the reason for that is that you know we all have the sense that the neural firing patterns in our brain those influence our thoughts right that would make sense but if that's the case then how can our thoughts also influence are you know the, the the neural firing patterns and then cause behavior and i think part of it is is a recognition that this doesn't happen instantaneously right there's there's some time that, that this takes to happen so it, it it's kind of a little bit like you know american football so you know during the the play you know the individual players are that that's what comprises the the actions of the team uh but after the play, you know, the, the players come back to the huddle and you know, in reality, the coach calls in the play in most of the times, but say in this case, the players decide among themselves, you know, I saw the tackle doing this, the nose guards doing that, let's run this play and they decide themselves and then go to the next play. So, um, I, it's, it's not an instantaneous process, uh, but I, I do think there's just abundant evidence that, that there is top down causation and that our mental states and thoughts influence our behavior. I, I, I think that's false, essentially falsified by this point. I, but, you know, I, I know there are a lot of smart people that disagree on this. Um, well, yeah, I know. Uh, it could be that it's the problem of language and the concepts as we're yeah. using them. You know, what do you mean by free or will or choice or volition? You know, there's hard determinists and I don't know what the other weak determinists and then there's compatibilists. Libertarian. You use the word libertarian for it. Usually means something like there's a little uh, homunculus in there, a little mini me, and you know the counter to that is. But then who's making calling the shots for mini me? It'd have to be a mini mini me telling mini me what to tell you what to do, and that 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 never made sense to me. Well, I don't. You know, I think it's. I, I like that analogy. The American football team is that the nerves together. You know, somehow, obviously, there's a lot we still don't understand about this. But the nerves themselves, which form you, those are making the decision. I don't see why there has to be a, a little person in, in the homunculus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, it depends what, how these concepts are formed. Yeah. Because I agree with you that there's higher order top-down causality going on there. Some part of me that's upstream from all the little impulses bubbling up from underneath, you know, would like to have the ice cream, blah, blah, blah. You know, and so I have all these competing things. And then somebody up there, me, <laughs> is making the choice. Uh, but again, that's just a word. It's probably just some neural network that it's a map of all the other maps, uh, you know, something, whatever we want to call it, yeah. something like that. That seems to me you can have a top down causality in the way, exactly the way you said it, without there being a mind separate from the brain. You see where I'm going with this. Uh, I can't make the leap to some metaphysical thing floating around up there making the decisions for this body. Y you are your body. There, there's no you and your body. There's just your body that includes your brain. Okay. That's how I think about it. Yeah. Uh, are you actually, I, but I have a feeling you're taking one more step, you know, that God gave us choice or God gave us a mind to make choices between doing good and doing evil, something like that. I mean, I do. I don't get into this in the book. I, I don't necessarily think it's immaterial. And I, and I don't think that, you know, pro I think one of the reasons, and if we want to get a little bit away from the science and more into the metaphysical and philosophical, I think some of the reasons that it's hard uh, for people who study science to believe in this sort of thing is because there's this notion that there's a magic to it, right? 
Um, right, right. And, yes. and yes. you know, people will throw around, around this term supernatural uh, to describe miracles and so forth. And I do that. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, guys. I know, I know. And <laughs> but I, I really don't like that term as it applies to my particular faith beliefs. Okay. I, you know, to me that in, invokes a God who somehow just kind of willy nilly breaks laws of nature and so forth. That's not my concept. At least you know. This might be a little outside the realm of, of traditional theism, but, you know, my God, there are certain rules and laws that, that, that even God seems to be subject to. And at least there's a sense that, you know, if God didn't obey those principles, he would cease to be God. Um, so, going back to this evolution, you know, I, I just, I, I think God works through the laws of nature. We just... There's still a lot of laws of nature that we we don't understand. So sometimes people, I think very intelligent people will say, you know, there's no such thing as miracle because it would break the laws of nature, blah, 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 that sort of thing. My definition of a miracle is not necessarily a breaking of the law of nature. It's it's maybe a higher higher level law that, that maybe comes into effect. Like say I, I have this phone, I could somehow go back uh, to say the 1600s and bring my <laughs> cell service with it. <laughs> you know, people would be amazed. Well, the first thing they do is it was they would probably try to burn me at the stake. Um, the <laughs> right. second thing is, you know, this would be miraculous, and it is miraculous, but mm -hmm. it's not breaking any of the laws of nature. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, I, there's a sense that that the the conception of deity is, you know, we get from a, a picture of Zeus who's just sitting on this throne in the sky and throwing down lightning bolts to cause things to happen. That that seems foreign to me. I think God works in ways that are in are consistent with the laws of, of nature and the universe, but there's a lot we still don't understand. Yeah. Okay, here's my analogy with that the Sydney Harris cartoon with the two mathematicians at the chalkboard with the equations <laughs> yeah. and then in the middle it says and then a miracle occurs and he one points to the other one. I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. <laughs> yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So you're not doing that. Okay, fine, good. Um, well, I'm, 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 so Theodosius uh, Dobzhansky, right? He's, yeah. he's the one who oh, said yeah. nothing, nothing yeah, in biology that, makes yeah. sense yeah, in light, uh, except in the light of evolution. Yeah. The other yeah, quote yeah. he has that I really like is that I am a creationist and an evolutionist. Evolution yeah. is God yeah. or nature's yeah. method of creation. Yeah. Now, this, this notion creationism, it, it kind of yeah. has, I, it, it carries a lot of baggage with it um, because people who so-called espouse creationism have been fighting against, you know, evidence and evolution and so forth. I just, I, I don't see it like that. I just see, you know, I, see I think we were created. Yeah. I yeah. just think there was a mechanism to it. It wasn't yeah, like snap a, your fingers. Right. Theistic evolution. I know it yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree that, you know, there's no argument to be made for the young earth or even the old earth creationists because they still have, uh, then the miracle occurs, you know, that every so yeah. often the deity reaches in to stir the particles to do something. To go mm -hmm. from RNA to DNA for the eye, the bacterial flagellum, or whatever. Okay, none of that makes sense, and that that have has all been refuted by biologists and scientists. Where I think they make a better argument is, and here's how um, Stephen Meyer put it in his last book, the God the God Hypothesis, Return yeah. of the God Hypothesis, that the laws of nature have front loaded. This is how he puts it: front loaded into them a certain telos, that there's a directionality to how the laws of nature are going to unfold, where you're, I don't want to say inevitably, but it leads toward, like we said with convergent evolution, to you know limbs and wings and fins and fusiform bodies and eyes and ears and, and brains. And then, uh, then we can run through the Dawkins logic, game theory logic, where you end up with uh, selfish and selfless and altruism and kin selection, all that stuff. Is, is a, a logic. So the, the step he takes, let me see if I can say this correctly to represent him, is not that the deity is stepping in at any point. It's all front-loaded at the very beginning, at the Big Bang maybe, something like this. And, and so the unfolding of the universe is God's way of operating. Mm -hmm. Is it something like yeah. that that you're saying? That's what I'm kind of saying in the book, and it's kind of the God of Spinoza or, or some of the other yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. philosophers along his line. Yeah. I, you know, that 
that's what I put in the book because I feel, I feel like there is a framework of science that, that allows for that. Uh, it's much harder, I think, to come up with scientific replicable evidence of a personal God. I do have that belief that more stems from my, my personal experiences. But, uh, but yeah, what, what I argue and, and lay forth is kind of like what you said, that there are laws of nature that, that a, you know, a, a deity is working through these laws of nature and has framed this mortal experience that we have as a sort of test between good and evil that is inherent within us. Yeah. Let me read you a section here from my Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, my chapter on the uh, Louisiana creationism trial, where, so this was the state of Louisiana passed an equal time law. The local ACLU challenged it and won, and on appeal, it went to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the two of the justices, uh, Rehnquist and Scalia, uh, voted against voted in favor of the original ruling in the state of Louisiana. <laughs> Get the double negatives <laughs> correct there. And the ACLU lawyer, Topkis is his name, Jay Topkis, argued that these arguments that the creationists made, similar to what I just said, uh, are sneaking religion into the public school, and therefore it's violation of the Second Amendment. Okay, so Rehnquist says to Topkis, my next question is going to be whether you considered Aristotelianism a religion. And Topka says, of course not. Rehnquist, well, then you could believe in a first cause, an unmoved mover that may be impersonal and has no obligation of obedience or veneration for men, and in fact doesn't care about what happens to mankind at all. Topka says, right. And Rehnquist says, and believe in creation. And Topka says, well, not when creation means creation by a divine creator. And Rehnquist says, and I ask you, it depends on what you mean by divine. If all you mean is a first cause, an impersonal mover, and Topka says, divine, your honor, has connotations beyond, I respectfully submit. And Rehnquist says, but the statue doesn't say divine. And he says, no. All it says is creation. All right. So, I mean, Top, uh, Rehnquist really nailed him on that. And so and I, uh, on that particular case, the ACLU had to scramble and go, okay, he's right. So what is our <laughs> argument here? Uh, okay, they're actually doing science. It's just bad science. <laughs> And they're not trying to sneak in religion, right? So, but that but that gets back to that kind of Aristotelian first cause. The laws of nature are just the way that they are; that they have a kind of telos built into them. Yeah, I, I yeah, actually I it, don't necessarily disagree with that. It's yeah. it, that's probably it. It is the case. All that right. is I'll, the universe I'll, we live in. I'll make a believer out of you yet. No, <laughs> <laughs> there's hope for my soul. <laughs> Although, see, there the next step would be um, the scientists would say, well, maybe there's multiple universes and they have different laws of nature. Some have more telos built into them, some don't, and here we are. We're in the lucky one that happened to, like the anthropic principle. So this is, yeah, this okay. is related to the fine-tuning. Yes, a little right. bit. Exactly, yeah. 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 yeah, why is it the way it is? Well, because that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, but inquiring minds want to know, and you can't just sure. do the, and then a miracle happens, right? So, <laughs> and, and at some point here, Sam, I think we just hit an epistemological wall where we just don't know. Nobody knows. We don't know if there's a multiple universes. We don't know that. And we don't know if there's a God for sure. We don't. So, you know, it could be we just hit a wall and go, I don't know. And that's your leap of faith right there, well, right? Well, uh, I, I think, honestly, I think part of it was designed to be a choice. Uh, I think that you, can, you can have evidence on, on both sides of this. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to think about, well, if, if God exists, why didn't he make a universe in which we kind of, we don't have to believe or, and, and I think that in part that speaks a little bit to this notion that a lot of people have that, that there's a benevolence to this entity, this uh, creator. Um, because if, if, if he weren't like you, I, I, I try to avoid using pronouns, but if God weren't like yep. this, uh, <laughs> Don't do then, pronouns. I don't do pronouns. <laughs> if God were like this, like in a in a benevolent benevolent uh, nature, uh, we wouldn't. There wouldn't be any room to believe. We would know. You know, it, it'd kind of be like a dictatorial state. There wouldn't be this choice. It's like, okay, yeah, we know there's a there's a higher power, and we don't really have much choice to to believe or disbelieve. So. Um, I think that's built into it that uh, that there is a choice here. Yeah, 
Well, here's how I define God. Uh, well, I'm just kind of reiterating what, how I think most people define God as all-powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, omniscient, and all-good, omnibenevolent, who created out of nothing the universe and everything in it, who is uncreated and eternal, a perfect, non-corporeal spirit who created, loves, and can grant eternal life to humans. Is that roughly how you think of God? No. No. Oh, good. Tell me. Uh, again, the, you know, the, we're getting away from the book here a yeah, little that's bit. Yeah, okay. That's uh, all right. That's so, good. So, <laughs> but um, at least my particular faith tradition, there, there's, there's not creation ex nihilo. Okay. Uh, there's there's this organized material, and God organized it. Um, you know the the omnipotence and the omniscience and the omnibenevolence of God is 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 tricky. Uh, and I think you know the, this is probably one of the best arguments for atheism is is the problem of pain. You, you talked about. I'm sure you've thought and talked about this quite a bit. And uh, you know there. It, it doesn't make sense if God is all powerful and all good that there's so much what seems to be gratuitous suffering in, in the world. And, and, and part of this also with, with evolution, you know, one of the reasons that people, the, the believers have been so um, skeptical of evolution is what, you know, what Darwin realizes, what a terrible waste. If, if life is only propelled forward by death and destruction, you know what a terrible waste this this would be, but um, but I think it's possible that look this is the way it is. This is you know, and so is does all powerful mean that you can do things that are kind of what which are metaphysically impossible, or you know, can God make a hotel that has infinite number of rooms, or make a rock so big that he couldn't? You know, some of these are are not necessarily very practical. I think you know my. My thought of what is omnipotent mean is that everything that can be done, God can do. But there are some things, there are laws that that if if God did not uphold, God would cease to be God. So, um, uh, well, my, my okay. view of God is is fairly different than what the standard you Christian read. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting because that maybe that does solve the the Odyssey problem of evil. That not just that. Humans make bad choices. God gave us choice, and we chose yeah. to murder, genocide, yeah. or whatever. And you know, too bad. Uh, that's the, we screwed up. But like childhood leukemia. Yeah. You know, what? Why? What? Come on. Pediatric oncology wards. Why do they exist? Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, it's horrible. It why is would horrible. God? So your yeah. argument is that? Well, I think this was what's his name's book. Uh, why bad things happen to good people. Kushner. Kushner. Uh, that God simply can't do anything about it because this is the universe we live in. Uh, but I guess the the counter to that is, well, why couldn't he if he's om, om, omnipotent? But you're saying that's not the way to think about it. He well, is the universe, and it is just the way it is. There, there's lots of there's lots of you know, there, there's a couple key categories of suffering that you've started to delineate, right? One is because of the poor choices of others. You know, someone chooses to mur murder. Obviously, you know the the victim suffers as well as the family members of the victim. But then there's this, you know, natural disasters, disease, that sort of thing that is no one's fault. This is not the cause of someone's uh, poor choices. Um, I don't necessarily think that it's the, it, my, my thinking about omnipotence that, that has to do with that. I, you know, I, I don't know uh, why it has to be, or it, why it's so unfair. Uh, you know, I, ha I do have a deep conviction. There's a God. I think part of it, at least in my particular faith, there's this notion that, you know, I didn't push back at the time, but that our consciousness has existed before this life. We clearly mm -hmm. don't remember that. At least I don't. Maybe you do. <laughs> but, and that, Pre that com coming, <laughs> yes, yes. And coming here, there was an, an element of choice to it. And, you know, I, I don't know how exactly much we knew about this, but, but this notion of there was a consent to come here, that helps. It doesn't necessarily fully overcome the problem of evil, but it makes it a little bit more tractable. Um, but also this notion that, that, that this isn't necessarily gratuitous, that things will be made whole and that, that suffering will somehow be 
um, be recompensed and, and, and made whole. Let, let me shift a little bit. I, I do want to come back to this, but as a bit of a tangent, you know, an interesting aspect of our evolution, I mentioned about our children and how they're so immature. Um, there seems to be this inextricable link, right, between love and suffering. If you ask a parent what is the most challenging thing of, they've done, most of the time they'll say, we'll raise kids. And you say, what's the most rewarding thing you've done? We'll raise kids, right? And those things are inextricably linked. Uh, let me try to drive this point home by... You know, let's imagine what our social lives would be like if we were seahorses, okay? So seahorses, you know, besides the fact that there's male pregnancy, which would likely lead to some very different parental leave policies. I don't like the sound of this already. (laughs) (laughs) Seahorses give birth to about 2,000 offspring at once, but once they're they're born, it's kind of like, good luck, you're on your own. No, No human being knows exactly what it's like to be a seahorse, but it's a good bet they don't care about their children very much yeah. because, you know, the, there's not that obligatory parental investment to use a term from, from yeah. evolutionary psychology. You know, so, so if, you know, as I believe, evolution is the mechanism by which we were created, uh, there's this intrinsic link between deep love and compelling sacrifice, right? You, we, we can't, you know, the reason we love our kids so much is because they're so darn challenging to raise, you know, they need us so much, Right. And so, to circle back a little bit, um, you know, this suffering, it, it, at least in my faith, there's this, there's this notion that there is opposition in the universe. So, you know, the suffering could be recompensed with, with a higher and deeper level of, of joy at, at some point. Obviously, you know, if, if it all ends with this life, then the universe is profoundly unfair. Mm-hmm. Um, A lot of us, I think, have a deep sense that that's not necessarily the end of the play. All right. How does the universe or God or whoever in the next life uh, 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 square the problem of, say, Eichmann? How how do we make that right? How do we make that whole again? Or Heydrich or Hitler or who? pick any Nazi you like. (laughs) I don't know. I I certainly don't have all the answers. Um, I don't have all the answers. But I, I do have well, a deep conviction. I don't think that, anybody has the answer well, to that. Well, yeah, yeah. How, how would the, you? I mean, this is why these questions are continue to perplex us. And but okay, and, so but what I'm after, why believe it then? If you don't know, uh, you don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows if there's a cosmic uh, courthouse that it, it all gets settled in the next life. It would be nice to believe that Eichmann's going to get his. Well, he did. He, we hung him, <laughs> yeah. so he got his. And you know, we're going to do that to anybody else that tries to do that. Okay, that's as good as we can do right now. What would it be in the next life? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So uh, then, okay, so here's the ultimate question. Why believe it? Okay, is it okay in your worldview to make that leap of faith? Let us let me use an analogy, free will and determinism. We'll go back to that. Okay. I don't know for sure that the free will arguments are better than the deterministic arguments. I happen to think that they are. But, you know, people smarter than me, like Robert Sapolsky, makes a really good compelling case, and it goes back and forth. Maybe it, it, it's just a useful fiction for me to believe that I have free will, even if the whole universe is determined and it's tumors all the way down or neurons all the way down <laughs> or whatever. Um, and, you know, this is what my friend, the late um, uh, Martin Gardner called fideism. He got that from William James, um, that it's okay to make a leap of faith to believe something if under two conditions, what has to be really important to human life. I mean, like what yeah. you know, making choices, believing in God, believing in the afterlife. These are huge, important subjects yeah. that really make a difference in your life. It, yeah. If it's important to you and it makes a difference in your life and no one can refute it anyway, it's okay to make the leap of faith. So in the case of Martin Gardner, I don't know if you know this story, but you know, he's, he's one of the founders of the modern skeptical movement. I mean, he's like, a major debunker of Scientology and UFOs and Uri Geller and spoon banding astrology, all that stuff. He just, you know, spent a career debunking all that bullshit. And then says, by the way, I believe in God and prayer and an afterlife. And you can imagine all the people like Dawkins <laughs> going, what? <laughs> Martin. And, but he made a philosophical argument saying this is William James's sort of a pragmatic truth. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, I mean, he even says, I think atheists have slightly better arguments than theists, but the theist arguments are not c- completely crazy. So they could be right. 
And in any case, who knows for sure? Nobody. And it makes me feel better. It changes my life. I'm not trying to convert anybody to anything. You believe whatever you want. This is what I believe. You ask me. I'm telling you what I believe. I'm not telling you. You have to follow me. And he kind of left it at that. I thought, okay, I respect that. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard you talk about him before. I'll, I'll have to tell me the name again. Martin. Yeah. Martin Gardner. Yeah. Martin Gardner. I'll send uh, you the, I'll, I'll send you the section from my chapter in my forthcoming book on this guy. I kind of recounted all that. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll have as a to way, look, as look a way up. of kind of uh, the next, my next book's on truth. You know, are there kind of truths that are not empirical? They're not scientific truths. We're never going to get at it. You know, what's the right, here's my analogy. What's the right income tax for the upper bracket people? There's no right answer. It's a political question. What's the yeah. right percentage for immigration? How many should we let in every year? You know, obviously now too many. Before maybe it was not enough. You know, whatever. But that's there's you know, uh, uh, and and some are insoluble. Like pro-life, pro-choice. I'm pro-choice, but the pro-life people they have good arguments. Yeah. It's true. You you know, an abortion is killing an actual living organism that is a potential human and person. And absolutely okay. So yeah. But but there there's not a. I don't know how you get a correct scientific answer and i think religious truths are often along these lines you know they're almost like mythic truths they're truths in their own way that have deeper meaning so my analogy is like asking you know is you know, in the in the lord of the rings trilogy is there really this place you know middle land or whatever it was called no you're missing the point or in harry potter is there really a train depot seven and a half whatever yeah. that number nine was three quarters. Nine yeah. and three quarters you're asking the wrong question like asking you know, you know, was Jonah really swallowed by a, what was it really? Was it a great fish or was it a whale? Okay. You're asking the wrong questions. This is, that's not what the story is about. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, um, I do think there are deep truths. I, there's certainly things that seem at least from the, the current way we conduct science that are unknowable. And, uh, some of these things seem to be, uh, somewhat important. I, you know, again, this this comes back. I, I'm we're, we're we're far afield from my book at this point, so hopefully my publicist is not too upset with me. But um, <laughs> no, we're just talking. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll plug the book lots. Don't worry. Uh, uh, you know, I, I part of this is my personal experiences. That you know, I, the, there came a time when I had to decide. You know, these things that I've been taught by my parents my whole life, do I actually believe them? And there was a lot of struggle and wrestling with myself and my thoughts and prayer. That's the thing for me. And I, in a way that is very personal, uh, I feel like I've got, I've got my answers. So I, I do believe there are things that you can know. Now, the tricky thing is, is when, you know, someone says, hey, guy, I've got this revelation from God and all you people need to do this. And, you know, that, that becomes tricky very quickly, as you know. So, um, you know, there needs to be this respect, I think, for individual choice in any sort of religious or, or similar type movement. And, and people need to do it for themselves and, and feel it themselves. And coercion in religion, things go down really hell really quickly when you, when you, when you mix them together. Nope. But is is it in the same sense, I'll use my other example I always bring up on the show, is Ken Miller, you know, who's one of the uh, first to debunk the intelligent design creationism. He's a great scientist and so on, but he's a Catholic. And he wrote this book mm -hmm. about uh, Darwin, yeah. evolution, and so on. So the last chapter, by the way, <clears throat> same thing with Francis Collins. You know, I, I mean, I, I, I recommend his book, The Language of God. Yep. Uh, and, and then at the, you know, the end, the last chapter, oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. So, okay. Uh, in, in the, it, are you saying in that sense, like where, where Ken says, Look, I'm not claiming that Jesus rose from the dead, literally. I'm not saying this is some kind of scientific test. If we got a piece of the true cross and a little bit of flesh on there and got the DNA out, you know, you're missing the point of what the resurrection means in the Catholic or Christian tradition to ask these detailed scientific questions. Do, do you think of it that way? It's, it's in a different kind of realm, a different kind of truth. Non-overlapping magisteria. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Okay. I, do, I do think that ultimately they're going to lead to the same place. They're, they're, so, they're, you know, in my faith, we use the word revelation, right? And that's kind of when God tells you something directly. And you know, there's times when it, that seems to be at odds with maybe what science is telling us. And when that's the case, it's either 
bad revelation or bad science or both. Um, I, I, I think that all truth can be, you know, is, is self-consistent. Uh, so, um, you know, these, these are deep philosophical questions that we're getting into here. That's but right. I, this is good. I, this is I, good stuff. I, <laughs> I, 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 do, I do believe that they're going to eventually lead to the same place. And the, and the perceived conflicts, um, you know, again, whether it's false religion or false science or both, you know, that, that's, the, that's the perceived conflict between, you know, say, science and faith. Um, okay, well, there are methods we can use to detect the difference between bad science and good science, junk science, voodoo science, and so on. Yeah. Uh, like the recent replication crisis in yep. psychology and medicine. Now we know, okay, there's p-hacking and this file drawer problem. Okay, we're going to correct those. What would that be for revelation? What would be the difference between, say, good revelation and bad revelation? How, how would you evaluate it? Well, um, that's a good question. Again, in, in my personal views, it's going to, there's, there's going to be an emotional component to it. And that's tricky because sometimes I'm very well aware as a psychiatrist, sometimes emotions go, go, go right. But it's also going to be consistent with logic. So there's going to be a rational aspect to it. Um, the way we, we talk about this in, in my particular faith is that through, you know, through your mind and your heart, with the metaphor of, of ration, rationality and, and emotion. Um, but it's also going to be consistent with, um, you know, kind of the, the, the structure that is in existence. Right? So, so if you want to talk about the particulars of my faith, we can, we can definitely go into that. You know, there, there's some interesting parts of that. You probably know a fair amount about it. Um, but it has to be kind of consistent within this framework. So there's, there's these rules that, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get a, a prompt from God that is going to tell you what your neighbor should be doing. You're going to get a prompt from God to tell you what you're going to be doing and what your family can be doing. And so there's, there's an order to it. Um, uh, that, you know, that, that is part of it. And, and, you know, I do think that it, that it can be though, a, a process sorting this out is is tricky. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's say we encountered extraterrestrial intelligences. If they were a social species of some kind, they probably would have evolved something like uh, reciprocal altruism and yeah. and you know kin selection, love, friendship, you know commitment, reputation management, all these things because those matter. Those derive from the logic of kind of game theory analysis of how yeah. social organisms have to interact with each other. So I would even, you know, say love is, is something that's in the universe. I don't go quite so far as say uh, Robert Wright's book, Non-Zero, where he actually thinks, well, maybe I do go part of the way with him, that love is, a, is built in, you know, front-loaded, say, into the universe itself. Um, okay, but then what's the next step after that in, in terms of, I mean, why do you need God above that? Isn't that good enough? So in other words, how, how is it you're making the next step? Uh, if, and if you're saying, well, this is my faith. I was raised this way. This is what I believe. Okay, I, I'm good. That's fine. Because that's true for a lot of parts of our lives that are not just science. Um, but you're saying something different, that there is a way to test. Would, would the Mormon religion have evolved in some other planet? Whereas I suspect maybe Judaism wouldn't, or Hinduism probably wouldn't. Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> you're asking these questions in ways that I've I've never considered them. Well, this here's you your know, next book. This is your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Think of it that way. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so I, a lot of this comes down again back to my personal experiences. You know, the, another part of this that it. it I've been a little hesitant, but you kind of keep going. You, you keep banging on this door is I just, I can't explain away the Book of Mormon. So, um, okay. you know, it, it, it came from somewhere. If you want a little bit of a background of it, I'd be happy to go through it. You probably know about it. Um, it's, well, I don't you know, know that much about it. I mean, okay. uh, you know, a little bit, but I mean, I saw the play <laughs> <Does it come laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know a lot of Mormons. I like a lot of Mormons. I also know a lot of former Mormons. Mormons, they, yeah. call, they call themselves. Yeah, ex-Mormons. Um, 
So, but yeah. had you been raised Jewish in Europe a century ago or whatever, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't believe any of this stuff. You'd be you'd be a Jew, and you'd be making the same argument slightly differently. But you know, we yeah, got yeah. the right one, and yeah. so this is my problem with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of it is the newness of this, right? It, you know, my faith is particularly new, and uh, so many of these other faiths, they their their origins go back a long, long time. So, um, you know, uh, the Book of Mormon was published in 1830. You know, whether you believe it or not, that's that's kind of fact. And uh, it it purports to be this this you know this ancient record of peoples that live here. And you know, a lot of people have been dismissive of it. Well, you know, he just made it up, that sort of thing. It's a remarkably complex document, and even the detractors, it's pretty well documented. It, it he wrote it down at about a pace of eight pages a day. He didn't stop and edit. And, you know, whenever he took a break, he picked up where he left off. And in a period of about two to three months, you get, you know, from page one to, I think there's about 530 pages. And it's, you know, it's a complex thing that came from somewhere. And, uh, you know, I think if I try to be as honest as I can intellectually, it's, it's hard to explain in any other way. Then that, you know, he, he claims, and I believe it, uh, that this was given to him from God. And it's a record from, of, a, of an ancient people. And it's evidence that there's God and that God loves us and has a plan for our existence and, and so on and so forth. So um, there are, you know, there, there are certainly critics of it and says, well, there's evidence against it in this case. But there's also actually a lot of evidence for it. And the fact that there's some evidence for it. It's like, how, how is that possible? If, if this, you know, he was, let's see, he was about 24, 25 when it, when it was published. Um, this, this man yeah, uh, okay. in, in New York named Joseph Smith. Yeah, Joseph yeah. Smith. Yeah. Let's come back to that for a second. Let me go back yeah. to my analogy. Let's yeah. say you're an anthropologist from Mars or, or, okay. or, 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 or Vega or wherever, yeah. uh, and you come to Earth. Now, for them to get here, they, they will have had to master mathematics and, and Newtonian physics and yeah. maybe some Einsteinian physics to make fine-tuned adjustments in their orbit trajectories and so on to get here. Now, they're not going to call it Newtonian physics because somebody else will have figured it out on their planet. But yeah. they, won't, they won't be surprised that we figured it out at our particular level of development. But they're not going to find anything remotely like that with religion. You know, they're going to see, oh, look, there's these Jews and there's you know, there's, I don't know, 16 million Jews and there's 2.1 billion Christians and there's a billion and a half Muslims and there's you know, 500 million Hindus, and so on. Which is the right one? And maybe they encounter half a dozen people like you going, well, I'm the right one. Look at my book. I mean, <laughs> and it's incredible. He was only 24 when he, you know, yeah, he, yeah. he yeah, transcribed yeah. the thing. Yeah. You look, know the stories. And it's yeah, like, yeah. they're going to go, hey, look, guys, this is your, this is something different from this science thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I certainly think that there is, you know, you, you talk about this kind of other level of truth. There seems to be that in a lot of these faiths. I, I have no qualms with saying that. And I certainly don't believe that, you know, if you're not a uh, part of my particular faith in this life, that you're doomed to hell or anything like that. There, in, in some sense, we're, we're universalists and that if you don't get a chance or if your chance is different than someone else's in this mortal sphere, you're going to, you're going to have those opportunities later on. Um, so, uh, yes. Do I think there are people who are inspired outside of, you know, my very narrow culture of faith? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, I'm not Muslim, but the writings of Muhammad are, are, are in many ways can, are, are very inspiring. Um, so I, I don't know how to answer your question other than that. Look, I, th I think there are some deep fundamental truths one is that our, ac our existence is not accidental, that, that this experience that we're having as human beings on this earth, it is in some sense a test. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to do better at the test if we can somehow form loving families that help us choose the better aspects of our nature. And as much as we can to make society a better place, I... I can't prove to you that there's an afterlife in the same way that I can prove that, you know, the first round of COVID vaccines are safe and effective, but I have a deep conviction that it's the case. And I'm, I'm going to continue to live my life as, as if that's the truth, because it's, it's brought me 
a lot of meaning and it makes me, I think, a better person than, than I would be otherwise. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. All right. I would put that in that pragmatic personal truth category. Yeah. You're pushing yeah. for something slightly more than that. All right. On the Book of Mormon thing, didn't they have something about the Native Americans were the lost tribes of Israel and they didn't, they haven't been, they weren't here 10,000 years, 10, 20,000 years ago? Weren't they wrong about that? The genetics disproved all that? Yeah, well, so uh, the story is that there's a, a, a fam one or two families that left uh, the old world and, and came here around 600, 700 years uh, BC um, and, and joined a, you know, a larger population. Uh, so uh, you're, you're right in that, I mean, when, when the Europeans came and, and wiped out, you know, 95% of the, the native uh, colonies, I, I think it's very... Uh, possible that, that this, you know, that, that made it difficult to detect things. So you're right that, that you know, some point to genetics and say, well, yeah, look, this is just this is a fraud. But there are other things, uh, particularly literary devices that are found in the language. So let me, let me share one example with you, if that's all right. So um, there's, a, there's an ancient Hebrew literary form. It's called chiasmus. And that the chiasmus comes from X, the, the Greek letter X. And it's essentially a literary form where you have you know, a couple different themes, you go A, B, and then B, A, right? So, um, you know, say, uh, my ways are not God's ways and God, God's, you know, minds or thoughts are not like my thoughts, right? So you have A, B, B, A, and it can become much more complex where you get A, B, C, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, that sort of thing. So um, there are very complex structures within the actual text, you know, well before this kind of form was, quote, rediscovered, in in the new world so um again i'm not i'm not denying that there's some evidence uh that you know that doesn't exactly line up but you know a lot of it seems to be the absence of evidence like oh we haven't found the city that sort of thing but the fact that there is evidence on in the four column that to me is 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 remarkable and and you know I, you just can't just throw it out the window because it's 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 a complex. Maybe not. Picture. Maybe you can pick and choose the parts that are good. I mean, I grew up with yeah. Mormons in Southern California. I know a lot of Mormons. Yeah, nice Mormons. You know, there's parts of it that are really great. You know, the family structure, the mm -hmm. charity, the tithing. You know, taking care of uh, people that can't take care of themselves. All all that's great. Um, you know, but why buy all the other stuff? Okay, so if you're if you're relying on revelation at all, well, you know, so Joseph Smith gets this revelation about polygamy. Yeah, you know he's he's married and he's seeing this other woman. He wants to see this other woman. I forget what the timeline was, but in any case, he takes up with her and then gets a revelation from God. <laughs> Speaking of male psychology yeah. and nature, hey. how convenient, you know. So sorry to to be kind of uh, snarky about this, but you know, reading John Krakauer's book Under the Banner of Heaven, where he recounts this, you know. He goes back to his wife, honey, I've been talking to God. <laughs> and he says, I have to, you know, marry this. And it's like, what? Okay, come on. You know, that just has to be completely made up. And then, and then, it, it, just let me finish the thought. And, and I, I'm going to sound insulting. Sorry, I don't mean to do that. But, you know, and then they get a, uh, an, another revelation in 1896 or two, whenever it was, when Utah wanted to join the Union. The United States says, you, you got you to gotta dump the polygamy stuff. We're not having that. In yeah. our country. And then all of a sudden, God gives another revelation. Or in the 70s, you know, okay, it's okay for blacks to be, you know, ministers in our church. Oh, okay. Right in the middle of the civil rights? Okay, come on. Obviously, this is human, cultural, political. This isn't, rev God's not telling anybody anything. These are just guys following their impulses and following cultural trends and political movements and things like that. That's how I see that. <laughs> Sorry, I, I said that in a very kind of not respectful way. No, uh, I, I mean, I get it, right? I get it. And and are there parts of my particular face history that I don't like? Yeah, but I, I can't just throw away the personal experiences that I've had. Okay. And, and so, um, you know, I don't have all the answers for that. Uh, certainly there, when, in my experience, when I've, I've had what I feel like was a, you know, some information that came from outside of my head, it's mixed up with my own thoughts. And I have to kind of wrestle out, okay, yeah, that, that part was probably just my own thinking. And that part, this other part was, 
was myself. So again, I don't have the answers, but I, I can't just count my personal experience. I, and I, honestly, again, um, you know, it, it is a remarkable book, the Book of Mormon. Uh, so your, you know, your parents were Mormon, yeah. and were their yeah. parents Mormon? How far back do you go? Uh, back a ways. Well, my grandmother was not. Um, well, at least until she had kind of a deathbed conversion. Mm. <laughs> she, was, uh, she was baptized within a few months of dying from cancer. She died yeah. at a, what today would be considered an early age of, of 50. Um, uh, yeah. well, I understand, Samuel, but I just had an imam on uh, last week. We haven't yeah. aired it yet. You know, yeah. talking about the Quran, and he, and he says yeah. pretty much the same thing you're saying. Yeah, it yeah. is an amazing yeah. document. It and is. You yeah. know, Twenty yeah, yeah. minutes no. later, okay. he's still going on about this and that. Yeah. I'm like, wow, yeah, okay, I get that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. how how is an outsider like me to to know if you got the right one or the imam got the right one? Yeah, well, I you know you have to you have to make your own choice and and read it and and if. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, make if you're my own choice. Man, I know. But okay, but yeah, so so, yeah. so if God's <laughs> judging us in the afterlife, and I go, well, sorry, I th I thought it was the Quran. No, you picked the wrong one. Well, I don't. I yeah, I don't. That's <laughs> okay, not my type okay, of God, okay. right? So okay, good. I <laughs> I I don't think clearly there's going to be a consideration given for uh, people's personal circumstances, the the experience they have, that sort of thing, their environment. So, um, you know, I. Uh, yeah, I, I clearly have this in my heritage, but there was a point where I kind of had to say, do I actually believe all this? Because some of it, you know, I, I get it. You know, some of it seems kind of kooky. Um, <laughs> it does. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I can't deny the, the experiences that I've had. And, yeah, and the, yeah. You know, yeah. so. This is why I'm pushing for these different kinds of truths and, and showing respect for people like Joseph Campbell and uh, Jordan Peterson, you know, talking about mythic truths. Um, again, I think, you know, trying to use science in any way, like these are, uh, you know, overlapping and they're arriving at the same truth, could could backfire for you. Uh, it, it, for, for example, when I do God debates with theists, these are usually Christians in a church or something. Yeah. Uh, and I ask the congregation, you know, if it turned out my arguments are better than his tonight, are you going to give up your belief that Jesus was your savior? No, they're not, because none <laughs> of that was why they believed in the first place. It's not yeah. based on these arguments. Oh, the prime mover and the first cause and the this and that fine tuning there that, that's not why they believe yeah 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 a, lo <laughs> so, a lot of a lot of it comes down to personal experience so um you know i i do think if if you ask and you really want to know um in time you'll get an answer yeah and that you know that that may not sound scientific but i i think there's some truth to that there are some some books about this, uh, Hearing the Voices of God. I've had a couple of podcast uh, episodes on this. I'll send you the links of people yeah. who study people who, well, hear the voice of God. Not exactly. I mean, are they actually hearing voices like a schizophrenic? No, it's not like that at all. They're just living their lives and they have these impulses. Oh, I should do this or that. And I think that maybe was God nudging me. You know, maybe some of that, again, in this kind of mythic sense, is how the human experience happens you know we do have an inner voice <laughs> yeah that maybe my dog doesn't have <laughs> i'm pretty sure he doesn't uh you know that's special to our species and and again as you pointed out we don't know the pro you know the hard problem of consciousness what you know where that comes from and all that yep. so okay you know so, all right sam you've been super generous thank you for letting me push you on some of these issues i do that because i'm interested in myself as you know yeah. i was a born again christian yep. for about seven years and so you know i'm a, I, you know a, uh, I'm I'm wrestling with the problem myself. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, because I think everybody should, because it's it's important. It is. Yeah. yeah. These these are important issues. And there's and your and there's th the sequel for... to purpose. The other yeah. the next purpose. <laughs> no, I love the book. The book is again. I, you know, there's pretty much everything you said in here. I'm like, yep, yep. I agree. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, you know, then you can the next book you can take the next step, whatever that would be. <laughs> yeah. Well